good morning, Central. Hey, it's great to see you. Let's stand to our feet together this morning. Let's start off our year by saying, God, we are here for you. Have your way in this place this morning. Let our praise be your welcome. Let our songs be a sign. We are here for you. We are here for you. Let your breath come from heaven. Fill our hearts with your life. We are here. Turn to somebody you haven't seen yet, maybe somebody you don't know, say good morning, introduce yourself.
good morning, and you may be seated, and happy 2018. This is our first New Year's service of 2018, and we're so glad you are here. Exciting times, exciting things going on, and to speak of, tonight at 5 o'clock, and then Wednesday at 6.30 in the choir room, there is an exciting meeting about partnering with Nicaragua. Min, Mindy Russell is back there right now, even there's a meeting. Don't run out now, you'll hurt Pastor Scott's feelings, but... You can come back tonight at 5 o'clock or Wednesday at 6.30 in the choir room right behind us and hear about partnering on this great mission trip endeavor. And it is 2018, and that means what better way than we could celebrate this new year, as you can see on the steps in front of us, than to remember our Lord and Savior, what he did for us by partaking of the Lord's Supper. Amen? So you're so excited. I can see that. So we are going to bring in the new year by celebrating and remembering what Jesus Christ did for us by taking the Lord's Supper. So the service is going to be a little different, a little bit more reflective as we partake of the Lord's Supper. And at this time, we're going to ask that our Deacon of the Week, Don Palmer, come and lead us in the offering. We're going to take up the offering now. And I'm going to ask that while Don is praying for us, that you stop, take a moment, reflect on what Christ has done for you personally. And I will say this, if you cannot reflect then maybe you need to examine your life and say, do I truly know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior? Again, what a great way to start off this year than remembering what Christ has done for us and how he paid the price for our sins. So, Brother Don, I'm going to ask that you bless our offering as we take this time to remember what Jesus Christ has done for us. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, just thank you that uh, we could be here today and worship you and praise you and and to remember, Jesus, what you did. You brought salvation to us. Lord, we owe you so much. You are the one that cares for us so much. And Lord, we just look at this time when we think about the Lord's Supper and the time you spent on the cross. And, and uh, as we think about the bread and we think about the juice and uh, your body and your blood was the salvation that we have. Lord, thank you for taking care of us. And Lord, we just ask your blessing on this offering. It's in Jesus' name we ask. Amen. So in just a couple of moments, Pastor Scott's going to come and he's going to share a message about um, communion and the Lord's Supper. So right now, actually, we're going to be dismissing our children to go ahead and go to Children's Church. Our service is going to be a little abbreviated this morning. So we're going to dismiss our kids to go uh, ages four years old through kindergarten first out these doors over here, four years old through kindergarten. And as they're being dismissed, I just want to uh, fill you in if you haven't heard yet. Our children's minister, Deborah Stevens, her husband is actually undergoing surgery uh, today 
on uh, one of his feet. And uh, if you know Clay, he's one of our Sunday school teachers down there. A lot of the kids love him, but we need to be in prayer for their family this morning. If you think about that, make sure and uh, lift them up. Send her a text of encouragement. Uh, Right now, let's dismiss our first through third graders to be dismissed to go to Children's Church. Now, I do want to say, parents, we are taking up the Lord's Supper. So if your child is is a child who's uh, professed to believe in Jesus and has been baptized, um, you know, it's up to you every week when we dismiss our kids to go. If you want to keep a child in here to participate in the service here, you can do that. And uh, today would be a good day for that as well. So um, looks like they're all out of the building. So let's uh, let's prepare our hearts. And we're going to do that first by watching this video. Good morning, church. Hope you're doing well. Today's a special day because we get to come to the table. The table has been set before us, and today we get to participate in this. This is not a a service for spectators. This is a uh, service for participants, and, and it is our prayer that each and every one of you will participate and prepare your hearts ready to take the Lord's Supper Uh, here in a few moments. I read a story this last week about a man and a woman who became incredibly close friends. And uh, really, one became a part of another one in the sense that they began to have lunch together at least twice a month. Uh, His name was Jermaine Washington and her name was Michelle Stevens. And uh, they weren't romantically involved by any means. They were simply friends. They became friends because uh, Michelle Stevens needed a kidney and Jermaine Washington gave his kidney to her. And, uh, and as a result of that, they became great friends. And they would meet uh, at lunch together two or three times a, a month, and they would always call it a gratitude lunch. And, and that would make sense because they came together to celebrate life. And folks, that's what we get to do today. We get to celebrate life. And, and, uh, and, and our Lord gave us much more than a kidney. He gave us His very life so that we might experience life. And so in a few moments, uh, after I get through with, uh, with our teaching this morning, we're going to uh, sing some more songs. We're going to worship the Lord together more. And then uh, when the time is right and I introduce this to you, you'll be able to come and self-serve by coming to one of the tables here this morning and, uh, and to celebrate um, uh, what the Lord did for you. Uh, by taking of the bread and by taking of the, of the juice. And so uh, we're going to turn in our Bibles, if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 for the most part, and we'll also look at a few verses uh, in uh, chapter 10 as well. Uh, but, but we go really to the Apostle Paul and we ask him, what is the Lord's Supper? Uh, what is this thing that we call Holy Communion? Uh, basically, Paul gives us 10 different things that he tells a, a, about what the Lord's Supper is. The very first thing is it's an act of obedience. Notice what the, the Scripture says in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four. 24. He says, do this in remembrance of me. If you've got your sermon notes in front of you, you might want to circle the words, do this. Now, I want you to repeat after me, all right? It's really simple. Do this. Yeah, there, there it is. There, there's the command. It's an act of obedience. And so when we partake of the Lord's Supper, you are actually fulfilling a command. This is in the declarative uh, a note of when, when Jesus, uh, when Paul is quoting Jesus about uh, how we're to do this, when we take the bread and, and, the, and, and the drink and we consume it, 
we as believers, as followers of Christ, are following Him in His command to, to do this. And, uh, and what is this? It, it is by taking the bread and by taking the drink and, and by consuming it. it. It is ordained by our Lord as an act of obedience. Now, some churches call these sacraments. We call them an ordinance. And, and really the difference is, is that we don't believe that by taking the, the juice or taking the bread has anything to do with salvation. But we believe that by, because of salvation, we take the bread and the juice. Does that make sense? We don't do this to obtain the body of Christ. We've already obtained His body. We've already uh, been a recipient of His blood. And as a result of that, we, go, we come to the table and we, we partake. It is an act of obedience. Number two, it is an act of identification. In other words, this, this, this thing that is called the Lord's Supper is called the Lord's Supper. Say, say that. Say, the Lord's Supper. I mean, l- l- let's actually say it, all right? The Lord's Supper. That much better. Uh, there's just something about it when we repeat something and we underline something, it becomes more, uh, more relevant to who we are. This is His Supper. This is not Scott's Supper. It's not your Supper. It's not the church's Supper. This is the Lord's Supper. And so when we partake of it, we, we are identifying ourselves as followers of Christ, as, as people that know Him as Savior. Now, if you're here this morning and, and you don't know Christ as Savior, if you're watching this by Facebook and, and, and you don't you know, have a relationship with, with Christ, we're glad you're here. We're, we're excited that you're considering this possibility of becoming a follower of Christ. And, uh, and so in a few moments when we partake of this, uh, you're under no obligation. Matter of fact, if you're not a believer of Christ, we would, we would ask you not to partake of it because just like baptism is for believers only, the Lord's Supper is for believers only as well. However, if you choose today to become a follower of Christ, to turn your life to Him, we invite you to come and to partake of the Lord's Supper because it belongs to Him and it belongs to those who know Him as Savior. Number three, it is an act of a covenant. A covenant. It is an act of a covenant. Notice what it says in 1 Corinthians 11.2. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Would you say new covenant together? One, two, three. New covenant. This is not the old covenant. This is the new covenant. And what is the difference between a covenant and a contract? Now, almost all of you, how many of you are homeowners? Lift up your hand. All right. In other words, how many of you does the bank own your home? And probably, probably more so that. But, but, you know, you sign a contract I sure hope I'm speaking truth right now. <laughs> you sign a contract, you know, whenever you buy a house and, and you're under contract, but what's the difference between that and a covenant? A covenant, you know, when you get married, that's not a contract. We call that a covenant. And so what's the difference between a contract and a covenant? The best definition, the best way I know how to define it in, in elementary terms is that a covenant uh, or a, a contract is something that is born here on earth, but a covenant is born in heaven. And so you have a covenant with God, because God is the one who gave us a covenant, and you also can have a covenant with man, but it was God's idea to begin with. That's marriage is a a God idea. It's not a man idea. God's the one who came up with it. And so so a covenant is born in in heaven. Of course, the old covenant, we we know, is the story of the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, the very word testament means covenant. Uh, The Old Testament could easily be translated the old covenant, and the New Testament is the new uh, covenant. And, and uh, you might remember how the Old Covenant got started. Uh, the, the children of Israel were, were uh, in Egyptian bondage. And uh, Moses came to, to uh, Pharaoh and said, what did he say? Let my people go. Uh, they would not respond uh, to it. And so uh, many plagues, ten plagues, came upon the children of, uh, of Egypt and upon the land of Egypt. And you remember the last one, the final one. Uh, God told uh, Moses to tell the children of Israel to go and to take a, a, a spotless year old male uh, lamb to take that lamb and to crucify to sacrifice that that lamb and to take the blood of that innocent lamb and to put it on the doorpost of their homes and that very night the spirit of god would 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 basically uh, uh, pass over the homes and every home that had the blood stained on their doorpost their li- their firstborn children were or firstborn son was was spared and literally God passed over them and brought brought protection to that family and so it is a, is an act of a covenant Jesus himself came not only to fulfill the Old Testament covenant the old covenant but he became a new covenant for us in other words Jesus would die on the cross for us 
He would make us His people. We would repent of our sin. We would, ret- we would turn our life to Him. And, and uh, the, the blood of Christ would become the one and last sacrifice that was needed in order to purchase our salvation. And so, so the Lord's Supper is an act of a covenant. Number four, it is an act of participation. I said earlier that, that this morning service, uh, spectators were not allowed, only participants. And so we basically get to participate uh, by taking the juice, by taking the bread, by, by identifying, but also by coming together. The, the thing I, I love about the Lord's Supper is that it was designed not for individuals, but it was designed for the church corporately to take. Does that mean you can't take the Lord's Supper by yourself at home? No, you could do that anytime you wanted, you know, but there's power in it when we come together as a congregation, as a church, and we do it together. It is an act of participation. Notice what the scripture says in 1 Corinthians 10, 16. It says communion in the blood and the body of Christ. Uh, That word communion literally can be translated sharing. And so when we commune with one another, we we share and we participate together. Uh, Number five, it is an act of thanksgiving. It is an act of thanksgiving. Every time I uh, start a prayer meeting that, that I am in charge of, whether it be online or when, whether I'm with people, we always start with Psalms 100, verse 4. Does anybody know what Psalms 100, verse 4 is? We enter His courts and we enter His gates with what? With thanksgivings and with praises. And so the Lord's Supper is all about giving thanks to the Lord. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four 24 says, When He had given thanks, He broke bread. You've heard of the, the term Eucharist. We don't use that term that often in a Baptist church, but, but the very name Eucharist is a transliteration of the Greek to give thanks. It comes from two Greek words, ou, which means uh, good, and charis, which means grace, meaning we recognize good grace of God's gratitude. You ever wonder where the tradition of praying before we eat our meals come from? Well, it basically comes from three passages of Scripture. The first one is when Jesus fed the 5,000. What did he do before uh, they ate? Uh, he gave thanks. Same thing with the feeding of the 4,000, and the same thing with the Lord's Supper. Before the Lord's Supper took place, he stopped and he gave thanks. Number six, it is an act of representation. Jesus said, this is my what? My body. This is my blood. Now, we need to be careful to make certain that we understand that Jesus is speaking symbolic here. Some churches believe, the Catholic faith believes that uh, that the, the wine literally becomes the, the blood of Jesus and the bread literally becomes the, the body of Christ. We don't hold to that. We believe that it's symbolic. Uh, we believe that the, the Scripture sometimes teaches things that are symbolic. For example, uh, when, the, when Jesus talked about it, if, you're, if your eye you know, causes you to sin, go and pluck it out. As far as I can tell, nobody in here has plucked their eyes out because they have uh, they've sinned. Well, we take that symbolically. And then yet Jesus spoke literally when he talked about you can take this body and it will die, but on the third day it will what? It will come back to life. It will be resurrected. And we, we take that literal. And so there are times that we take the Scripture literally. There's times that we take it figuratively. And we believe uh, as, we, as we look at the body and the blood of Christ, we believe this is a representation. It's a symbol. It's a very powerful symbol of, uh, of Christ, what he did for us on the cross. And then number seven, we believe it's an act of commemoration. Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. Circle the word remembrance and say the word remembrance with me. One, two, three, remembrance. We are to remember. You know, there are some things that are locked into my brain as far as things that I remember. Some things good, some things not so good. But one of the things that I am so thankful for as a believer in Christ is that we get to remember what Jesus did for us. I want you to think about it this way. If you were the last sinner on earth and no one else needed salvation, Jesus would have still died on the cross for you. I want you to remember that. I want you to hold on to that. I want you to think about about what this Lord's Supper is supposed to remind you of, not just to, to remind you of what He did for you, but to remind you of what He wants you to do for Him. It is an act of remembrance. And then number eight, it is an act of examination. There is no doubt we are never to take the Lord's Supper unless we examine our hearts. It says in 1 Corinthians 11, 28, let a man examine himself uh, and so let him eat. In other words, before we take the Lord's Supper, 
we need to do a type of self-examination. The Lord's Supper should be a time not only of self-examination, but of deep introspection uh, of sorts. Not just about our natural-born tendencies to sin, but specific um, uh, unrepented sin that we are still holding on to. That that uh, maybe our attitudes, maybe our motives, may, maybe we have, you know, l- let's admit it, maybe we've just been so stinking busy that we haven't even slowed down here this morning to stop and think about what we're about to do. It is an act of examination. You're going to have a great opportunity in the next 10 minutes or so to examine your hearts when Ryland comes and leads us into some more and more singing. Number nine, it is an act of proclamation. Say the word proclamation. I love this. As often as you eat it, you proclaim the Lord's death. Now, I tell people when I, when I baptize them that you are about to preach a, a better sermon than I could ever preach in a lifetime because when you're baptized, you proclaim, you tell a story of, of, of following Christ. I, I really want to just stop for a moment and just encourage you. I, I, there are probably many people in the sanctuary right now or watching by Facebook Live that you've never been baptized as after becoming a believer in Christ. I want to encourage you, be baptized, not just for the sake of baptism, but because of what Christ has done in your life, because of Him coming into your life. That's a, a proclamation to the world that you will never regret making that, that huge pro, uh, uh, proclamation. Uh, of course, uh, we take the Lord's Supper, you're also proclaiming. You're proclaiming that you are a follower of Christ and that you know the Lord as Savior and as Lord. And then finally, it is an act of anticipation. Notice what he says in verse 26. As you proclaim the Lord's death, and, and let's, not, let's not stop there, until he comes. Circle the words, until he comes. And not only do we make this huge uh, uh, sermonette, in a sense, of, of that Christ is our Savior, but we do this until the Lord comes comes. Uh, to me, this is really where it gets exciting. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is where our proclamation really has feet in it. it, it we do it with expectation, that, that great expectation one day of, of His return. Are you ready? Not to take the Lord's Supper, but are you ready for His return? If you knew that he would come back, let's say, at the end of the day, would your afternoon be any different than what it's going to be? What's your plans this afternoon? Maybe a, a sunny afternoon nap? I mean, since the Cowboys and the Chiefs aren't playing, I mean, what does it matter, right? Maybe you can root against the, a team or, or whatever. What do you anticipate? I mean, I mean, if Christ, I mean, I, I want you to think about this. If Christ were to return tonight at 7 o'clock, what would you do differently today? And really, once you come to an answer to that question, shouldn't you probably go ahead and do what you just decided you would do if you knew Christ was going to return tonight? I love this quote by John Piper. He says, the purpose of the Lord's Supper is to receive from Christ the nourishment and strength and hope and joy that comes from feasting our souls on all He purchased for us on the cross, especially His own fellowship. And so tonight we get to participate, or this morning we get to participate in fellowshipping not only with one another, but we fellowship with the Lord as we take the Lord's Supper. I want you to bow your head with me just for a moment. I'm going to lead us in a prayer, and then Ryland's going to come, and he's going to continue on with our worship service uh, this, this morning. Father, it is my prayer in the name of Christ uh, that, uh, that you use this time of worship and uh, use our time as we examine our hearts, as we prepare our hearts uh, to take of the Lord's Supper. Father, I pray that uh, for those in this room that do not know you, for those in this room that you do not know, that you do not recognize as your children, that today would be the day that they would call upon your holy name. Today would be a day that they would turn from their their sin, they would turn from their life, and you would come into their lives and into their uh, 
uh, souls come into their hearts. That today would be a day that they would surrender their life to you. For those that know you as Savior, may we take very serious of each sin that we've committed, knowing why you came. Because you took every sin placed upon your back, upon your shoulders. Father, your body was broken for us because of our sin. Your blood was shed for us because of that sin. So may we not partake of this bread and this juice today without strongly considering what it is that you account for us. Father, I pray that in these songs, in these next few moments, that you would just come alive in our midst. I pray it in Jesus' name. I'm going to be sitting down here at the front. We're going to have our ministers that will be back in the counseling room that will be available to you. If at any given time during this time of praise and worship that you would like for one of us to pray with you as you prepare to take of the Lord's Supper, please come, talk to us. Let us pray with you during this time. As we sing these songs of worship to our God this morning, we're going to be intermingling some scripture readings between them. Right now, uh, Brother David's going to come, and he's going to start off our time reading uh, one of the prophecies. So as he begins to read, let's stand together, church, and prepare to sing and to worship our God this morning. Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 4. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up, he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. He was, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid it on him, the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and a sheep before his shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. Amen. Let's sing of the cross and the sacrifice of Jesus. There's a place where mercy. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide, where all the love I've ever found comes like a flood, comes flowing. Oh, oh, oh. 
the scripture of the prophecy. Now we're going to hear the scripture of the crucifixion. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hands. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, king of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took a staff and struck him again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away and crucified him. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots, and sitting down, they kept watch over, over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, 
and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of their tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God.
5 through 11. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. I love that we're doing this on the first Sunday of 2018. What a great reminder that this is why we come together. This is why we gather every Sunday morning. This is why we sing these songs because of what Christ has done for us. We put all of our hope this year in him. His blood is our victory. The cross that was meant to kill is our hope. Amen. Let's sing one final song together. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. done for me.
more time. This is amazing grace. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down. may be seated. In the next uh, 10, 15, 20 minutes of our time, we're going to be coming to the table. We have four tables that are prepared for you. Uh, there's no rush. We want to take our time when we do this. Uh, uh, there might be long lines that take place. I would just encourage you to just, just take in the moment today that we spend time praying where we're sitting if you feel impressed to stand and lift up your hands and praise to the Lord as the music continues playing, then do so. If you feel like you need to come to the altar and bow at the altar, you may do so as well. But as when you prepare yourself and you're ready to partake of the Lord's Supper, then simply I would ask that you either come as an individual or come as a family or come you know, with another uh, individual, whether it be a spouse or a parent or a child, and uh, just to come, already be prepared, take. Uh, of the, the ju juice and the bread and then you can go back to your seat after you've taken uh, the, the Lord's Supper together and uh, if you see a, a long line somewhere and there's a vacancy somewhere else then feel free to go to another table but this is just going to be a time where we're impromptu we just we, we get up as we feel impressed to do so and and uh, be just a time of worshipful praise and at the conclusion uh, we've got some more words that we want to share with you before we go home for the day Father I pray that now you would connect with your people and let your people connect with you. In the name of Jesus, come to the table. Jesus instructs.
scripture tells us that whenever the Lord's Supper had finished in that last supper, that they closed their time out by singing a hymn together, Jesus and the disciples and those that were there. And that's how we're going to close our service here today in just a moment. If you need prayer this morning, if you're just going through something you need to talk to a minister about, our connection room is always open. Our, our guys will be there. Um, if you're new to Central, we want to make sure that you connect with Pastor Scott. He'll be in the main foyer, and he'd love to shake your hand and, and get, to, get to know you and learn your name. And um, I'm so thankful that we were able to start off our year this way for 2018. I'm praying a blessed year for all of those uh, in our church family. Let's stand together and let's sing the doxology together, giving God praise this morning because he is worthy of it. Let's sing. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him. God's people said, amen. All right, you are dismissed. Have a great day.